So viewers, I recently had the great opportunity to meet someone who spent time living at Spawn Ranch during 1968 and 1969. This person, while they were not a member of the family, knew them and had some very interesting observations about them, not to mention a pretty wild tale of their own to tell. So today I am pleased to invite this guest back for a further conversation about life with the Manson family. So it is very good to see you again. You are choosing to keep your face and identity secure. For the, for the purpose of this interview, I will simply refer to you as Mr. X. And you can see up here, interview with Mr. X. So welcome. Hey, hey. Mr. X. Good to see you again. <laughs> so good to see you again. Part of, part of you anyway. <laughs> so let's start off with, can you give us just a brief backstory <laughs> of yourself, including how it is that you came to live at Spawn Ranch in 1968? Well, uh, San Fernando Valley is not where I grew up. I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. And uh, as a youngster, teenager, I was a drummer in a band. And we uh, got to play all over the place. And I wound up in uh, San, San Fernando Valley, oh, about 1966 when I graduated high school, my girlfriend lived up there. And I started to go to college up there, L.A. Pierce. And there I met a couple of friends, classmates. We all had the same interests. We all uh, discovered uh, Sergeant Pepper, uh, the movement, the hippie movement. We took classes. Uh, uh, religious classes about Eastern religions. And we got very interested in, in that way of life, meditating, uh, trying to expand our consciousness. And uh, as a result, we uh, wound up uh, taking LSD together for the first time, which at that time was still legal. And uh, from there, we uh, played music, meditated, and just enjoyed life until uh, until finally the time came when uh, we decided to drop out. And by that I mean we got a uh, an old uh, a door milk truck, converted it into what was what's now called an RV or, or a camper, and uh, started traveling around. And we wound up in. Uh, Santa Susana on a 2,000 acre horse ranch. The, uh, the owner of that ranch gave us a real good deal. He only charged us like $125 a month. And there was four of us living in this ranch house. He said the only catch was that we needed to uh, ride the horses at our leisure whenever we wanted, because he had a lot of horses. So we had a ball. Uh, it was rolling hills and riding horses i learned to ride uh, bareback I learned to saddle them up you know so we were having a good life and then i dropped out of college and really decided to uh to drop out and unbeknownst to me jack who uh, was one of my college mates and my roommate uh he discovered fountain of the world and started going over there and he told me about it. Well, that's where it all began. He met Charlie at Fountain of the World. And uh, next thing you know, he's telling me all about him. He said, oh, you gotta meet this guy. And I guess after a couple of visits to Fountain of the World, uh, he told us, well, why are you guys paying rent? You know, you could come over to Spawn's Ranch and I'm sure George will give give you permission to live there. There's plenty of outlaw, plenty of shacks on the property where we could, you know, convert our stuff. We could live in a bread truck or a milk truck. We could certainly live in, in an old shack, you know. So we took him up on it. And uh, we wound up, uh, Jack and I, going to Spawns and meeting George. And as soon as we told him that we lived in this 2,000 acre horse ranch up in Santa Susana, he knew the guy that owned the property. And he, he says, oh, wow, 
if he lets you live there, then I got no problem. You guys live in here. <laughs> but we didn't move in right away. Uh, Barbara, Jack's girlfriend at the time, she was pregnant. And now that we knew Charlie, and he knew that Barbara was pregnant, he said, well, why go to a hospital and have the baby when, when my girls can deliver it right in your house? You know, and that's what happened when she when she got close to giving birth. She started going through all her labor pains and stuff. We ran over to Spawn's and said, hey, it's time. And a bunch of the girls uh, hopped in the, the milk wagon and came up to our place and they delivered little Aaron. And the only problem oh, wow. was he uh, had a birth defect. The, his umbilical cord wasn't just popping out by itself. It brought along some of the insides with it. So right away, we went, uh-oh, this is no good. And Spawn's Ranch is like right on pretty close to the boundary of Ventura County. So actually, when you drive up San or Susana Pass towards Simi Valley, you cross over into Ventura County. So we figured Ventura County would, County Hospital would be the best place to go. That's where Sadie's Zizo was, because he was born premature. He was in the NIC, he was in the NICU underweight. there. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, uh, I guess he was, he was there at the same time uh, we brought uh, Barb and Aaron in. Tell me about Spawn Ranch. Give me sort of a, like a sense, memory, recollection of your first time at the ranch. What did it look like, smell like, feel like? And tell me about where you lived and the things that you did while living on the property. I was familiar with that kind of a movie set because years earlier, my father uh, and my mom took us on a day trip up to uh, what was called Hope Town at the time. Corganville. It was like, I think Iverson Ranch was in existence then too. They were like uh, movie sets, just like Spawns. So when I got the Spawns the first time, I, you know, I was kind of comfortable with, hey, gee, it's just like Corganville, you know, or just like Hope Town. Uh, but I didn't realize until recently, a few months ago, uh, I stopped by there because I had business in the area. And I decided I'm going to go up to Santa Susana Pass and take a look. And I was floored. It was late afternoon. It was a beautiful, clear day, bright sun, blue sky, and these rock outcroppings, of Spawn's Ranch and the surrounding hillsides were just, my jaw dropped. I'm like, wow, I didn't realize it was so freaking beautiful. I mean, it was very scenic. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, gee, I didn't realize how beautiful this place was. I mean, I was 19 years old when I lived there and I knew it was an awesome place. Um, all the hillsides, all I could see was Hopalong Cassidy <laughs> and the Lone Ranger uh, because a lot of that stuff was filmed out there. Very peaceful compared to uh, the rest of the valley. I mean, just a few miles away, you were in the thick of it traffic, traffic lights, uh, the noise of uh, city life, and then boom, all of a sudden, here you are on Santa Susana Pass at Spawn's Ranch, and it was like you stepped back in time. It was very quiet and peaceful. All you could hear were the horses and chickens and, and goats and, you know, the birds. There, I mean, it was a haven for birds. There was a lot of crows and hawks and squirrels and and then gophers and snakes and whatnot but i've always uh been a nature kind of person so that that, that stuff really uh excited me i go looking for snakes you know uh, looking for uh hawk nests so i could catch a baby hawk and you know but it was ideal it was like gee we could live here for free and just be ourselves and that's when uh we got introduced to Charlie's group, um, you know, and, and his group, uh, it varied. Uh, there might have been at one time less than 12 people, around 12 people there, but there were times when there was like 40, you know, 
And yeah, knowing Charlie, the first time I met him, literally, he gave me the shirt off his back. He happened to notice my. You bell told me the story. Tell me. tell his story. This is this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, they were uh, uh, embroidered, just like his shirt. His shirt had some embroidery on it. And he went, wow, that's a, those are far out pants. And I said, yeah, I like that shirt of yours. He goes, you want to trade? And I said, sure. <laughs> so I took my pants off. Good thing that day I had underwear on. But uh, <laughs> I gave him my pants and he gave me a shirt. I wish I still had that shirt. But uh, we were freaks. We were all freaks, okay? We all had looked different than your normal run of the mill teenager or young adult, you know, and people looked at us like we were freaks and, and we were, but we were, we were looking for a different way of life than this cookie cutter existence that everybody had before us. You know, my, my parents and a lot of parents at the time, they fought in the war for our freedom. So we won the right to be free. We question everything. You know, if you're honest and, and you're forthright and you care about yourself and others, hey, that's all we can expect as, be, as human beings. So there was a lot of things going on then, just like there are things similar going on today uh, that we didn't agree with, but we weren't radical, you know? Uh, we just wanted our own little mm -hmm. piece of pie and we wanted to exist the way we felt how to exist. You weren't at the ranch 24 seven, seven days a week. You know, <clears throat> uh, when we felt like going up to Big Sur, we'd go. Or we go out to Joshua Tree, we'd go. And, you know, but staying there, we went through all kinds of changes. We, uh, at first I had a Volkswagen bus and jack had a uh volkswagen beetle and then we traded up and got the milk uh milk truck and then later on that wasn't big enough and we wound up getting the 54 passenger school bus took all the seats out and we were doing this right at the same time charlie was converting his school bus we uh wound up uh, working on his bus and and he and some of his guys are helping us on ours and that's how, that's how I got to interact with the uh, Tex and Clem, Cupid, uh, Little Paul. We call him Little Paul. And of course, I got to meet everybody else. I got to meet uh, and make friends with uh, Juan. Juan was a character. I mean, you know, Juan he Flynn. was in the basketball. He'd have probably been pretty good because he was very athletic and he was super tall. He taught me how to ride the... Uh, mm -hmm bareback uh i tried it before and thought i was doing it right but boy he showed me some tricks that uh you know all of a sudden i can go just as fast you know riding a horse bareback than i could if i was on a saddle george, tell me about george spawn <laughs> at first you know i introduced myself uh, we all did and he was very cordial he uh he really didn't have any thing to say as much as uh like you know i don't want you doing this or that he pretty much got the run of the place he said i appreciate it if you help help around you know like with the horses and uh go riding because they need exercise and the, <clears throat> the most time they the most exercise they would get would be on the weekends you know when people come to rent them uh but during the week there was a lot of work and he had like 50 horses so it was a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know, but we could slip in and out, you know, there'd be times when uh, I wouldn't even, you know, lift a flake of hay uh, for a week or two, you know, <laughs> somebody else was doing it, you know, I got the impression that the girls, especially Squeaky, uh, really was under George's wing and or vice versa. And she looked after George. She didn't want other people coming up and bothering him. I guess out of their own preservation, it didn't seem like he was totally blind because there was a few times I saw him walking down the uh, the boardwalk there in front of the Longhorn 
by himself with his little dog out in front of him. And, and he wasn't tiptoeing with a cane. Uh -huh. like, you know, he was walking. So he probably played that off. Tell me a little bit about some of the people that you were living with there at Spawn Ranch. Well, like I said, Jack, Jack and I were classmates. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, one of her best friends, was named Barbara. And we introduced uh, Barbara to Jack. And she just graduated high school, just, just like uh, my girlfriend, Sue. And she took a liking to Jack and vice versa. And they were like inseparable. And they're still together today. This is like from 66 all the way to this present day. Yeah, it's great. And wow. they, she wound up having uh, more kids. Of course, like I said, Aaron passed away. He didn't, he didn't live too long. Uh, then I lost contact with him for over 40 years. And about 10 years ago, oh, wow. I uh, got on Facebook and punched in his name. And uh, no response. I thought, well, maybe he passed away. And then about six months later, I get this email. And it's, hey, Mr. X, is that you? <laughs> and I went, yeah, hey, Jack, how you doing? So it, it, was, it was quite a deal. You told me that Charlie had a sense of style about him and that every time you saw him, he looked a little different. Can you explain that? Oh. It's, it's there for the looking. I mean, uh, look at all the different pictures you see of Charlie. I, I've never, maybe once or twice, seen him with the same hairstyle, the hair cut. But he had this thing about him. One day he would, he would uh, shave, maybe not his uh, beard, but uh, his, or he'd shave his beard and leave, style his mustache a little different. Then he'd part his hair in a different way, and he looked totally different. It's like, what is this guy got a stylist? The girls must have fussed over him like crazy. They probably had him in a barber stool and they were like, oh, Charlie, you look good this way. And I mean, that's the impression I got. Like, uh, like these girls, they're taking care of him, <laughs> shaving him, trimming his beard, trimming his mustache, you know, cutting off his beard. You know, yeah, he, he was uh, he was a character. Changes. I mean, he would have been perfect uh, if he. Yeah, if he was on the run and they were looking for this certain character, you, you wouldn't recognize it. You wouldn't think that was the same person. You know. He's yeah, kind he of was, a chameleon in many ways. Him. He was a funny guy. I uh, totally and 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 psychotic. I mean, you know, he uh the poor guy had such a bad life being tossed around like a luggage, you know. Uh, he was, it was pounded into him that he'd never be a success in life. So he never, he never got the work ethic. You know, I don't, I don't think he ever mm. worked in a yes. place long enough to, to file income taxes. You know what I mean? He didn't, uh, he didn't have to worry about all the things that the rest of us have to worry about paying rent, utility bills, clothing, transportation, insurance, on and on and on. You just erase all that. He never had that responsibility. Let's face it, a guy that's whether he's five foot two or five foot six, 130, 140 pounds, and you're in the penitentiary. You eat, sleep, and drink there all the time, 24 seven. And there's predators everywhere you look. And they're, trying, they're out to prey on the week. And if you don't stand up for yourself, you get, you know, tricked out. You'll, you'll be at their beck and call. And, uh, you know, Charlie survived. Whatever he had to do in prison, he, he survived it. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but later on, I found out about being on parole. And, uh, you know, you, you have to have a residence, a verifiable residence. Your parole officer will come to your house. And even if he wears sneakers and he sneaks up to your window and looks in to see what you're doing, they've got that right to do that. You have no rights when you're on parole. Your rights are taken away from you.
They could stop you anytime and search mm -hmm. you anytime without any problem with cause. And here's Charlie skipping and hopping all over the countryside, not getting violated. And then on top of that, mm -hmm. uh, he never got tested. And you had a Dr. Green on a while back. Remember him? He worked at yep. mm -hmm. the uh, Haight Ashbury uh, Free Clinic. And he mentioned yes, on sir. that that he, uh, he, he, he was employed with the state of California at CRC in 1967. CRC is a California Rehabilitation Center, and it's for people that pull crimes because of their addiction. If it wasn't for their addiction, they would have never committed those crimes. So instead of sending them to prison uh, without any kind of counseling, they sent, they sent them to CRC. And uh, as soon as you got out of CRC, you don't go anywhere without peeing in a cup, so to speak. I mean, they tested you. And part of your parole conditions might be you not only aren't supposed to take drugs, but you're not supposed to drink either. And if they mm -hmm. caught you in a dirty test, more than likely they'll violate you. And that's they throw you yeah, back. A violation, you're locked up for six months. And they never tested Charlie. I never heard of that they did. Now, some people say, well, they didn't have that back then, but Dr. Green said he was at CRC in 67. They had to have that. Maybe they just did it to parolees from CRC. I, I don't know, but, but I don't think so. Maybe. Let me ask you about um, Charlie's music. We know that, you know, obviously he had interest in a music career. Did he share any of those ambitions or ideas with you? Oh yeah, we played uh, we played together. You know, he uh, he didn't seem like he was, you know, really gung ho about. Okay, let's let's really get tight and practice and play and play and play and uh, see what we can do with these songs. I know we had songs. Uh, I know he, he had a certain style uh, with the guitar. He could sing, uh, but my whole thought was, boy, if this guy had, if this guy had somebody, a band member or one of his followers, that wanted to pursue this uh, music, uh, pursue music as a career, uh, they could have steered Charlie a different way and really got him together as far as a marketable musician, you know. At the time, everybody wanted to be the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or Creedence Clearwater or Buffalo Springfield. They all wanted to do what they were doing. Now, whether it was just for the girls or, or for the notoriety, the money, either way, one hit song, you could probably live up the proceeds for the rest of your life. You know, look at today. There's some classic songs that are over 50 years, 60 years old. They're still making money. Uh, but he didn't have that. He, uh, and, and I know because I was in a band and I was in a band and I played professionally until 67. I was at the Monterey Pop Festival in 67, June of 67, Summer wow. of Love. Mm -hmm. And after that festival, uh, we had a couple of gigs in our band, but I just had other interests. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't handle the fact that every time you turn around, someone was trying to get you high, you know? And, you know, to be a successful musician, you have to put yourself in a place where you don't get any distractions for months at a time, and you do nothing but play your songs over and over. Now, if you're writing your own material, that's even harder because you, you have to develop this song. And you have to play it and tweak it and do all this stuff to it and get it to where it's part of your repertoire and you could play it at the drop of a dime. And then you, you had 15 or 20 of those. You can't just come out with one hit and think that's it. 
because if somebody signed you, That's they're going to want albums. So, so you have to have a big repertoire of songs. And Charlie, from what I heard, he had 60, 80 songs. But how did he develop them? Oh, he just sat in his jail cell strumming a song and playing, and that was it? You got to have an, an accompaniment, you know, drums, bass, electric guitar. I mean, you know, whatever. He never really, so I never really took him as a serious uh, musician. You know, I think it was more of a, I don't know, this is my opinion, just more of a coffee shop kind of performer. She, she was one of the girls that, that came up and helped deliver uh, Aaron. Uh, to me, she she had a little bit of a, I don't know, because she was older than the rest of us, a few years older. She she seemed to be more mature than the rest of them. You know, I think out of all the girls, she she was like, and, and people say this, she was she was Mother Mary, you know. She was the one everybody aspired to be, you know what I mean? They they because mm -hmm. she was a college graduate, she worked for you know for university you know she she was right there she was part of the establishment you know she she was in the position where she could she could have made a lot of changes to the university system you know to the curriculum i think you know and that's all that's all we wanted to do i mean we wanted to change the world you know yeah but she was uh little reserved she wasn't outgoing like you know most of them uh, you run into them walking walking uh, down the road i mean the outlaw shacks where we lived was about i'd say a quarter to a half a mile from the main street in spawn's ranch where the longhorn saloon was and you know uh and the terrain <clears throat> Of the ranch they really changed it from that fire because there was a road what what is now a little path that that goes uh, north used to be a road big enough for a school bus to drive down and it was it wasn't hilly it was flat you know and uh so we would walk from the shacks to the longhorn and uh, we run into some of the gals that's about the extent of it uh, most of the time, they, when I'd see them together, there'd be Mary, Lulu, Gypsy, uh, Sadie. Yeah. You know, Squeaky. And a couple others. That, uh, I remember um, Tex and Cupid seemed to hang together. They had, uh, they had a special interest. And Tex or Cupid and uh, Little Paul. Now, as far as musicians go, they they were, you know, they had a little more eye on the ball, so to speak, as far as what it takes to be a, you know, professional musician. So I think the music part of it, that's why Cupid and uh, Paul, you know, hit it off. And, uh, Tex too, but I don't think Tex played anything. I don't think he was a musician at all. You know. I don't think so. Do but you, they did a lot of work. Do you remember Charlie on, being particularly close with anybody? Vehicles. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, they had a lot of uh, tinkering with the engines and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of that going on because I remember. I'm surprised that most of the vehicles that that they had driving back and forth to Benedict Canyon in one night. Uh, it was a miracle that they even made it because half those cars that they had smoked, burned oil. I mean, you know, these are old clunkers, you know. Uh, but no, Charlie, uh, when you think about it, <clears throat> he had quite a responsibility. I mean, 
as far as being a leader, uh, there was at one time 40 people. How do you feed 40 people? They, they didn't have three meals a day. And no job. They would wake up and be lucky. Yeah, they, it would be a full-time job. And then uh, the way all the documentaries and all these stories are written about them, uh, nobody really addressed the logistics of taking care of 30, 40 people with no jobs. They had no, you know, income coming in. They would, many a times, uh, they would try to get us to join their family. And when this happened, when we had people join our family, whatever you had became, was donated to, to our cause. And uh, Charlie was the same way. If you wanted to join, you had to, whatever you had at the time became property of the family. And what can you offer the family? When the girls would come up, he just didn't take any old girl and say, oh yeah, you're cute enough. Come on, join the family. Uh-uh. She had to prove herself. They'd send her out with some of the other girls and they'd go dumpster diving and see how she could get over on some of these uh, people that worked in produce and, you know. And I forget who it was, one of the gals, it might have been Ruth Ann when she first, when she first uh, joined up, they went dumpster diving and one of the produce guys came out and she started talking to this guy. And all of a sudden uh, he's bringing out boxes of produce and putting it in their car. They didn't have to go in the dumpster to get it. They got it from him before it got to the dumpster <laughs> and he was giving him good stuff, wow. you know, There'd been many a times when mm -hmm. when a produce truck would show up on spawns and all the girls would run up to, hey, this is that guy we met, you know, and he'd open up the back door and out came 50 pound sacks of flour, 50 pound sacks of uh, rice. I mean, we lived on brown rice for practically the whole time. Whatever vegetables we can get to go with it. Brown rice was the base, <laughs> you know, uh, we would get it in 50 pound mm -hmm. bags, but that's the way, that's the way it was. If you couldn't come up with those, that kind a of contact with bringing in food. Yeah, it, it was, it was mind boggling how they, how they kept bringing in enough food to feed everybody. It has been said that Charlie closely controlled reading material at the ranch. Can you confirm this? Do you remember anyone reading books other than the Bible during your time there? You know, the only thing I ever remember is that Charlie had an old copy of uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. And he had it in his back pocket. And this, this was like his second Bible because he would... Uh, I mean, he, he named uh, from Mary's kid uh, after the main character in that book. But other than that, and other than the Bible, I, I never heard of anybody, you know, reading any books or not being able to read books. I mean, mm -hmm. we had a couple of uh, books where we never really read much. You know, there was always... There were other things other going things on at the time do. other than reading, basically. Yeah. Yeah. What about music? Yeah. We played music together. You know, we'd sit around a campfire at, at night and play. Uh, I, I wound up, uh, I was a drummer and I had all this drum equipment and I had to lug that all around. So whatever vehicle I had, it had to fit in there along with the rest of our stuff. So I wound up giving... Uh, Cupid, Bobby, we always called him Cupid, uh, a set of uh, Gretsch drums. And in turn, he gave us a sitar. And Jack was a guitar player, oh, so wow. he wanted to really learn the sitar. So this was the perfect time. 
and I had a set of tablas, but they were in the pawn shop, <laughs> and I uh, I planned on getting them out. I didn't want to give them away, so I, I never even mentioned them, <laughs> you know. But the drums, that was a relief <laughs> because I didn't have to deal with uh, lugging and then things are around. I wasn't playing, you know, anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we would play. Amazing. Uh, we'd listen to them. Sometimes we'd jam together, you know. But uh, I, I would hear them off uh, there where, where Charlie and, and the group lived. There was the main road where they had the Longhorn Saloon and and, uh, and all the, the boardwalk there. Then if you walk northwest, follow the road, maybe a few hundred feet down the road there was what I always call the rock house. And that was the, the house by the creek. And it had a, a huge, like eight foot wide, stone fireplace and so on the outside you'd see all the stones that would go up to above the roof line and so i always call it the rock house because that's all you would see it wasn't that pleasing architecturally other than you see this big old stone fireplace you know on the outside chimney and uh so that's where they lived and where the outlaw shacks were and that's where we lived so when they'd come up to see us, they had to walk up the hill and we'd see them coming, you know, for quite a ways, you know, 500 feet away, we'd see them coming. You know, here comes Charlie's robots because, <laughs> you know, we all joked around, we all kidded around, we were all stoned, you know, and uh, they all tried to say, when they weren't with Charlie, they all tried sounding like him. You know, they started preaching and, you know, hey, how's how's your ego today? You know, <laughs> you know. Oh, so wow. right away we uh, we so we, we saw that. But uh, let me let me ask this: We've talked a little bit about like you know doing dropping acid together. Talked a little bit about playing music together. So I have to ask: Did you witness, or were you aware of? or involved with, if you want to share, uh, any of the group sex among the family? Oh, huh. well, I knew that they, uh, they participated in, uh, in group activities. Now, as far as anything other than heterosexual encounters, never once heard of anything like that even mentioned. I don't know where all that came from, Mm -hmm. I even heard Paul, uh, some interviews with little Paul saying that that uh, Charlie had uh, you know, insisted that the guys would hook up with the guys. And I never heard of that. But as far as sex with, uh, with the girls, with his girls, that was a no-no. Mm -hmm. Now, I never heard anybody ever mention this in any of the documentaries or any of the books that you couldn't have relationship with with the uh, you know with the girls unless you were part of the family with the exception ah. if i was some big record producer and uh you know he obviously is not going to try to sway this guy and drop everything he has and come and living in a sleeping bag you know then then he would hook the girls up you know with them but as far as at home on the ranch uh-uh Unless, unless he had some purpose, like with the straight Satans, you know, he got protection mm -hmm. from them as long as he was supplying them with girls, you know. But there was a lot of times when uh, the girls would come up and, you know, uh, they'd ask if I had any smoke and I'd pull out some smoke and we'd all go hike up into the hills and sit on boulders and lay around and smoke. And you get to talking and getting to be friendly. And, you know, they were cute. And some of them thought I was cute. And, you know, there was a few times when, uh, yeah, I would have liked to have hooked up with some of them. But, uh-uh. Oh, you, 
you should join the family. Then we, then we could fool around anytime. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there was an exception uh, or two, you know, and I wound up getting okay. pretty close to uh, Squeaky. <laughs> she, she was cute. Very, very smart. She had some insight to her. She, uh, you know, it's a shame because uh, she went one way and I went the other way. And uh, I always thought that uh, if she'd have went the way I went, she'd have really had a lot to contribute. You know, she would have been a positive force, really. She would have been successful at whatever it was she wanted to do. And how she got tied up in, in the, you know, being a house mom for all those uh, Aryan Brotherhood people and uh, prison guys just getting out of prison. And, you know, I mean, come on. I thought she was more than that. When I knew her on the ranch, mm -hmm. she was this innocent, cute, young lady. You know, and I kind of didn't mm -hmm. agree with uh, why she spent so much time up at George's. You know, I mean, here's a guy that was 60 years older than her. But I guess she had a job to fulfill, you know. Charlie uh, mm -hmm. needed to make sure that they had a place to stay. And as long as she was at George's beck and call, you know, and everything was uh, copacetic, you know. But yeah, there's many a times we you tell me about wander um, off and uh, you know. Mm -hmm. What's that? Enjoy each other's company. You guys would enjoy each other's company. Yeah, yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not that I'm kissing and telling, but yeah, we. She, she set the rules. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. Uh, Dent them. She broke them. You rules. didn't have to be in the family <laughs> to enjoy her company. Yeah. Yes. Tell us. Tell us what happened with the situation with Susan. Oh yeah. With Sadie. <laughs> yeah. That 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 was really bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, um, we would. Uh, we weren't living on the ranch, but we knew all the Mansons, and we, uh, you know, we'd go to Spawns all the time. And they'd come up to our place. Yeah, you know, we'd cook meals there and they'd let them shower and stuff like that. <clears throat> well, at the time, right after Barbara gave birth to little Aaron, and then we found out that Susan's son, Zizo, was at the same hospital, uh, we told her, hey, when we're ready to go, you can come with, you know. She didn't have to hitchhike. And so we, at the time, we had that milk truck. And... Jack and Barb and me and Sue would drive up to Ventura uh, County Hospital just to see the babies, you know. And I'm in the back. She's in the back. And the, the back of the milk truck was all tapestry-covered mattresses and big pillows. And, uh, you know, I don't think we had a hookah, but a pot. <laughs> And I rolled up a big fatty and uh, we were smoking pot and passed it up to Jack and Barb and the whole place got all full of smoke. And uh, and all of a sudden I'm sitting in one corner in the back corner and she's sitting in the front corner behind behind the driver's seat. And I'm sitting in the very back. And all of a sudden her uh, she got very comfortable and her legs uh, opened up <laughs> and she made a motion. Her, her finger went like this to me. Like come here. And she called me over and she, she had lifted her arms up, you know, like she put one hand behind her head and, and the other arm reached out with her index finger signaling me to come over <laughs> come over here you know and she had, and she had her legs spread mm -hmm. and uh when she lifted up her arm all i could see was this big glob of sweaty black armpit hair <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh it was kind of a gross gesture and i wasn't ready for it 
and uh, <laughs> you know, there were a lot of a lot of things in the senses that interfered with it. You know, like the odors and uh, <laughs> mixed with the pot. <laughs> And, uh, I kind I just kind of signaled her no, not now, <laughs> but I'll never forget that. <laughs> and then, so uh, it was not. It was not a turn on for you. <laughs> no, it wasn't. That it, uh, it, it was just one of those things. But uh, a couple of years later, I happened to run across a picture of her uh, when she worked. But when she was hooked up with this Anton LaVey up in Frisco and they would do a satanic, uh, some satanic things. She uh, mm -hmm. played the part of some witch or some something. And she was naked. And uh, I looked at her and I looked at her twice. I went, wow. Boy, if I'd have known she looked like that, I might have changed my mind. But, you know, everything else was... <laughs> wasn't right, so it didn't happen. Mm -hmm.